Now the word of the Eternal One came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and denounce it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of God. He went down to Jaffa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Eternal One. But God held a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the sailors were afraid, and each cried to his God, and they threw the cargo that was on board the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean by sleeping? Arise, call upon your God. Perhaps your God will think of us so that we will not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. Yes, let's cast lots. On whose account has this evil come upon us? So they cast lots, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Eternal One, the God of Heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. What has this you've done? What shall we do to you that the sea may calm down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. Take me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will calm down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they cried to the Eternal One, We beseech you, O God, let us not perish for this man's life, and do not lay on us innocent blood, for you, O God, have done as it pleased you. So they took up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Eternal One exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Eternal One, and made vows. My name, Jonah. Did you know it means a dove? It's an apt name, because like Donah's dove, I flew off across the waters as fast as I could. It seems so many years ago now, but if I had my time over again, I would do exactly the same. You can read about all the other prophets who accepted God's call, but crying out against the world's most powerful city on my own was not for me. So I hoped to get to Tarshish at the opposite end of the world. When the waves started to rise up and the ship to toss around, the others prayed, but I slept. I slept deeply. I didn't care about my own life, and I didn't care about theirs. But as soon as the sailors cast lots and accused me, I owned up, though I never told them my mission. The sailors were amazing in the way they tried to save me. Their faith was far greater than mine, and they feared God even more when the sea calmed down than when it roared with rage. They were the courageous ones in my story. Then God appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Eternal One, his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to you, Eternal One, in my distress, and you answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood was round about me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. And then I said, I am cast out from your sight. Shall I ever look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep was round about me. Weeds were wrapped about my head. I sank to the base of the mountains. The earth was about to close its bars over me forever. Yet you brought me up from the grave, eternal one, my God. 
When my soul fainted within me, I remembered you, and my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their true loyalty, but I will sacrifice to you with grateful voice what I have vowed I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Eternal One. And God spoke to the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. This part of the story is not really the way I remember it. I don't even know if there really was a fish. I remember almost nothing from the moment my body hit the water until I came to on dry land. Some kind person has filled in the gap in the story with a lovely psalm, but for me it was anything but lovely. And yet, those poetic words do remind me of a feeling I had, of sinking further and further down, down below the waves, down even below the waters, deeper than ever, deep into the belly of the earth, and then a rush upwards, as if my body was being raised by a beautiful musical chorale. I came out of my coma as the notes ascended the scale to a slow crescendo, only to find myself wet and dripping on the lonely shore. Indeed, I had never felt so alone as I was on that deserted beach. I have never told anyone the story of my slow and painful recovery, and it will always be missing from the record. Then the word of God came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise! Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of God. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to walk into the city, going a day's journey, and he cried, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. When the tidings reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, removed his robe, and covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he made a proclamation declaring throughout Nineveh, By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither human nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not graze or drink water, but let them be covered with sackcloth. And let them cry aloud to God. Let everyone turn from their evil way and from the violence which is in their hands. Who knows? God may yet relent and abandon anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way. God relented concerning the evil intended for them and did not do it. Right up until the last moment, I had hoped the people of Nineveh would not listen. I kept my message short, thinking that nobody would take any notice of me at all. What happened next both amazed and disappointed me. It was a national repentance, a renunciation of violence, a longing for peace. Of course, it didn't last. But at the time it was astonishing and very unwelcome to me. How angry I became. I'd grown up in a world of superpowers and wars, a world where my tiny people and other ordinary tribes lived in constant fear of invasion and destruction. Why should those evil people of Nineveh benefit from God's love, care and forgiveness? From that same God who did so much to make my own life completely impossible. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry, and he prayed to God and said, I pray you, Eternal One, is not this what I feared when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you were a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in love and ready to pardon. 
Therefore, now, eternal one, take my life from me, I beseech you, for it is better for me to die than live. Do you do well to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. And the eternal God appointed a gourd and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his distress. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the gourd. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm which attacked the gourd so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God appointed a sultry east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah so that he grew faint and longed to die, saying, It would be better for me to die than to live. Do you do well to be angry about the good? I do well to be angry, angry enough to wish to die. You pity the good for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow which came into being in a night and perished in the night. And should not I have pity on Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? These days, most people don't even remember the whole story. They think it ended with the fish, which they insist on calling a whale. Who remembers how I was forced to watch, humiliated, as Nineveh was saved? When I myself look back, it's the plants and animals I remember these days. The sukkah that I built, the gourd that grew, the stupid cattle who wore the sackcloth as if they were repenting too. What crazy king made them do that? Those people of Nineveh were little better than their animals. God, why did you pity them? What good did it do me or my people? You nearly drowned me in the sea and even my little bit of shelter from the sun you destroyed. I didn't pity that good, I just felt sorry for myself. Are you really trying to tell me that we should love our enemies, not just our neighbours? Couldn't you have just left me alone? Your mercy is too strong for this terrible world. Your message too overwhelming. Your forgiveness too exhausting. This Jonah, this dove, brings no olive branch. How can I, when nobody cares about me? Thank you.